Well, good morning, Lion Hearts. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. Well, we're out of here. Much like we started right in front of this building, we're gonna end it in Sevilla here in front of this building. Time to go find a taxi, get to the airport, get to London, and get to seeing more. Days with Jordan the Lion begin now. All right, gang, another adventure begins. We're becoming quite the world travelers together, aren't we? <laughs> we see a lot of places. Saran wrap? Yes. All right, we are through, and I am extremely lucky they didn't weigh my bags. Sometimes on the uh, cheaper airlines, they want to weigh your bags, because then they'll charge you, and uh, they definitely would have got me if they would have. <laughs> so thank you, British Airways, for not milking me to death. Well, I just checked in, and I think I found where I'm going to be sitting, waiting for a plane to take off. We have about uh, about 40 minutes before it takes off. Well, we got the very back seat on the plane. I don't know if that's good or bad, but we did get a window seat, and that's always good. Until you've left the aircraft! by Sevilla. All right guys, so originally the plan was to uh, spend our whole day at Hampton Court when we arrive, but I think it's just not gonna happen because from the time that we arrive, it takes an hour to get there, and a lot of people say you need like four to five hours to spend there. So I've reconstructed and put together a celebrity all-star tour that I'm gonna take us on when we get there. I'm gonna show you some incredible sights. I don't know if it'll be one vlog or two, but it'll be really worth it. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain has sat on the first seatbelt sign with you be allowed to begin to load together. All right, we're about to land. All right, let's get to the city now. Oh, nice. They made a collage out of uh, a younger and older Queen Elizabeth II. Well, customs took over an hour and a half, but we're on our way. It's about another hour train ride to our destination. I was starving when I got here, so I decided to get something. Uh, it's kind of fast food here, but they have like vegan options and all this kind of other stuff. So the women here uh, gave me a recommendation, so we went with the Sicilian meatballs. Well, it looks pretty freaking good. I can't wait to try it. Oh yeah, it's the first time I've ever had this. Really good. I actually saw a couple of people walking around with it uh, when I was here the last time, like a week ago. So I was hoping to try it anyway. It was pretty good. I'll go get those girls on camera before we leave too. So these are the lovely ladies that recommended my food to me. Thank you very much, ladies. Well, let's go find where I'm staying and start vlogging. Wow, look at that. Victoria Palace Theater. What a beauty, huh? Well, here we are, gang. Our first stop right by where I'm staying, the famed Royal Albert Hall. Opened in 1867 by Queen Victoria. This place has seen it all. Regular performers were Eric Clapton, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix recorded and played here. You name it, they've probably been here. Now there's, right on the front, there's a little thing I wanna show you. Kinda nice. It says the south porch was opened by Her Majesty the Queen on the 30th of March, 2004. Now this statue in front is a commemoration for the Prince of Wales, um, who inaugurated this when it first opened. What a great statue, going all the way around. Take a look at that. The Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee steps were named in the celebration of Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee 2012. The inscription commemorates the visit of Her Majesty the Queen patron of the Royal Albert Hall and the Royal British Legion before the annual Festival of Remembrance, 9th of November, 2013. 
Now this is what I love. I always tell you, travel by foot, travel by foot. Look what I just saw. Queen's first public performance in London here, July 18th, 1970. At the Imperial College of London. Dude, Queen performed there. Freddie Mercury, Brian May, Roger Taylor. How awesome is that? Now since it took us so long to get through customs, I'm gonna do exactly what I just told you not to do, which is I'm gonna take an Uber to one of our stops, and it's the only thing that we're gonna to do today that I wanna actually tour, so let's go. Now we're just waiting for our ride. So where we're headed to now is uh, I wanna go over to Charles Dickens' house. You know Charles Dickens. They've turned it into a museum and apparently you can tour it. Charles Dickens is probably most famous for Oliver Twist and uh, a Christmas Carol, probably the most famous Christmas story other than, well, probably more famous than the movie Christmas Story of all time. Now here's the Queen's Gate entrance to Hyde Park. We'll be back here later and we'll probably, actually maybe you'll see that tomorrow in tomorrow's vlog. Well, hot dog guys, here we are. The former home and now current museum of the man who wrote Nicholas Nickleby, A Tale of Two Cities, David Copperfield, uh, wow, Oliver Twist. It's almost unbelievable that we're here. How cool is this? Great expectations. And I do believe he wrote um, Oliver Twist while living here. Let's go. Let's go check it out. His door. Well, guys, unfortunately, we just wasted our time coming here. We are uh, like five minutes too late. They will not allow me to go in. That is really unfortunate. I'll tell you what, guys, that is, um, that's pretty heartless. I, I'm here five minutes later than what they allow people in and they still won't let me in. In fact, uh, it's like 4.05 and uh, yeah, they're not letting anybody in. So there you'll at least get to see a bust of him. You would have thought they would have wanted to take my money for as little time as they have to be open, but oh well, let's move along. Sorry guys, maybe next, actually, I will, I will not come back here, so this is the most we'll ever see. Sorry about that, guys. Well, this is as much as you guys are gonna get to see the museum. I'll just show you this. It says, uh, the home of Charles Dickens and his young family. This is where he wrote Oliver Twist and Nicholas Nickleby, and the first achieved global fame. Uh, it says inside, filled with his family belongings as if they still live there. Boy, I bet that would have been really awesome to see. Treasures include the author's writing desk, his handwritten novel drafts, and his wife Catherine's engagement ring. That's uh, yeah, that's uh, that just flat out sucks. Let's move on. I'm just gonna tell you guys that that place that's totally heartless for somebody to be five minutes after. I still would have had 55 minutes to tour it. So, I mean, I I'm. If you ever wonder like, hey, what's your biggest letdown? Or This was it, this was the biggest letdown. I just spent 30 euros to get here just to be told, hey, you're five minutes too late. Well, at least we gotta see the outside. Sorry to be such a downer about it, guys, but I think just the, uh, the cruelness of the situation that I was five minutes late, I think, uh, I think that would upset anyone. So now we'll just stick to doing what I do best, going to free places and telling the stories. So where we're headed to now, is the very first place in London that Mr. Robert Nesta Marley, Bob Marley and the Whalers lived when they moved to London in 1970. That ain't it. Man, what a beauty. Actually, you know what? It was 1972 that he came here because, well, I'll tell you when we get there why I remembered that. Wow, we're not going in here today, but check that out. King Edward VII's galleries, His Majesty King Edward VII. Wow, nice lions. Oh, but technically the British Museum. Honorable Henry Cavendish, natural philosopher, lived here. So this is kind of interesting. This is called the Bonham Carter House and it says, the first antiseptic given in England was administered in a house on this site. Oh, we found it. We found what we're looking for. Well, here's the street. I'm really excited to see this. I love Bob Marley. Well, inside this building, this is Rosemont Gardens. 
says 25 to 36. In number 34, Bob and the Whalers lived in 1972. Now how I remembered that was right after I said it, I go, wait a minute. What made me a Bob Marley fan was seeing the Whalers on the Old Grey Whistle Test. And that was in 1973. So you can see right up there, the sign says Robert Nesta Marley, 1945 to 1981. Singer, lyricist, and Rastafarian icon lived here in 1972. Now when they did that move here, it wasn't as easy as you might think. Now what brought him here was Johnny Nash, the man who sang, um, I can see clearly now the rain is gone, heard them, knew that he was a big star in Jamaica and thought he could probably get Bob a deal in London to record some albums and make him a bigger star. Now, when they moved here because they were Rastafarians, they, uh, they were all ve vegetarian, uh, or maybe even vegan, I forget, but I think it was vegetarian. The city at that time was not really um, vegetarian friendly, so they had a lot of trouble finding places to eat. And, uh, you know, like I said, what made me a fan was seeing um, the Whalers perform Steer It Up on the Old Grey Whistle Test. So go on YouTube and check out that performance. They're high out of their minds. Peter Tosh looks like he's more relaxed than any man's ever been in his life, but it's one of the coolest, smoothest vibes to a song you've ever heard and one of the greatest performances I've ever seen anyone give. So, wow. Inside there, I wonder if the people that live in 34, they probably must know, Bob Marley lived here. Now you know what I'd do if I lived here. I'd be doing what they did in Poland that we just saw with every picture of, uh, Pope John Paul II. Whichever window was Bob's, I'd have a big old picture of Bob's face smiling right outside that window so everyone would know where he lived. Eh, you never know, someday. So now I wanna walk over to the Langham Hotel, which has a great Oscar Wilde story. Hello, freaking disco ball. Londoners, tell me who this is supposed to be. I know in theory it's supposed to be like the Marilyn Monroe pose, but it looks more like Beverly from Roseanne, Roseanne's mom. Oh, wow, check out that tower. The Radiant House. Now, that blue marker right over there says that that home was the former home of Hector Hugo Monroe also known as Saki, from 1870 to 1916, short story writer lived here. Well, here's our stop, the Langham Hotel. Now what I love about this was, this is the site of where Oscar Wilde and Arthur Conan Doyle, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, once had a dinner with a publisher that inspired Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to write his second Sherlock Holmes book, and Oscar Wilde to write Picture of Dorian Gray, one of my all-time favorites. Now, Dorian Gray is maybe one of my favorite stories of all time because it really kind of encaptures Oscar's mindset at the time. And in fact, uh, the house that we went to the other day over on Tight Street, he wrote Dorian Gray in that house with his wife and two sons there. Now, what Dorian Gray is about is it's about a man who's so beautiful that he can't see anything else in the world besides beauty. He falls in love with a woman that he views to be absolutely gorgeous and she's an actress and once he sees her perform he thinks that she's so bad that he falls out of love with her and she ends up dying um, so his friend ends up painting a portrait of Dorian and it ends up um, basically taking on all of Dorian's worst traits as Dorian is uh, all of his evil ugly traits as he acts them out all of those start showing in this beautiful portrait of Dorian that he's in love with and eventually um, he ends up having to uh, destroy it. Which was kind of one of the philosophies that Oscar Wilde always kind of lived by and always talked about was like, you will at some point die by um, your love of wh whatever it is, you will, um, you, you will end up being destroyed by the thing you love. I don't know about you, but I love seeing places that have that kind of history where one day change literature forever by two men. And if you think I'm a liar, I actually didn't know this was here, but I just looked up as I was walking around the building and found 
a little memorial that says that. It says Oscar Wilde and Arthur Conan Doyle dined here with the publisher of Lippincott's magazine on the 30th of August, 1889, a meeting that led to the sign of four and the picture of Dorian Gray. And uh, the plaque was put there by the Sherlock Holmes Society of London and the Oscar Wilde Society. God, that's so cool. I love history. I love seeing historical places like this. All right, let's head off to our next stop. Um, so and there's the front of the Langham. How cool. So we have a bit of a walk ahead of us, but our next stop will actually tie into what we just saw. What an entryway, huh? Well, take a look at that. Francis Hodgson Burnett, 1849 to 1924, writer, lives here. Well, here is a statue to Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, son of King George III. Passing by this, and I thought it was worth looking at. Royal Academy of Music. Well, unfortunately, we're not going to go in there today, but we are at the London Madame Tussauds, and if you ever saw my Madame Tussauds vlog, what an interesting lady she was. And no offense to her, as talented as, as she was as an artist, she was also known for being quite a fibber. Most of her history that she wrote about in her book was all fabricated. Well, we're not going to make it on this trip, but maybe the next one will come. We'll come and see Madame Tussauds London. This isn't what we were looking for, but I just saw it and thought it was worth pointing out. It says, beneath the roadway runs the world's first underground passenger railway. It was opened for public transportation January 10th, 1863. Now what we want to see is actually right behind here. I kind of would love to check this out, but we just don't have time today. The Wonder Pass, the Curiosities of Baker Street. Yeah, another one we'll do next time. Well, I think we've all heard of Baker Street, haven't we? And if you do know the name Baker Street, it's probably because of this man, Sherlock Holmes. See the Arthur Conan Doyle connection there, Sherlock Holmes. And then right around the corner, H.G. Wells, the author of The Time Machine, lived here. 1930 to 1936 at Chiltern Court. As well as at the same time, Arnold Bennett. Now right down this street is the Sherlock Holmes Museum and I wanted to show you what that looked like too even though we can't go in. I think it's already closed. Now there's another Chiltern Court right down, a few houses down or a few buildings down. It says Eric Coates, the composer, lived here. But then also, check out what else happened here. In this building, SOE's Norwegian section planned the Telemark raid to disrupt development of Nazi atomic weapons. Well, here's a little foreshadowing, my friends. Even though I'm not a huge Beatles fan, I know many of you are, so our next stop will be for you. And of course, I don't know. you know it's going to have something to do with that picture. Check this out. Here's the Sherlock Holmes Museum. Unfortunately, we just don't have time. They're closing up already, but... Uh, Pretty cool. Guy that works here is uh, dressed like one of the constables. There's the famous address, 221B. How cool is this to actually see the address? I know some of you out there are loving this right now. How cool. Yep, pretty freaking cool to see.
Yeah, originally I wasn't going to go where we're going to next, but I thought, you know, a lot of people would like to see it, and it's really not that far out of my way. It's kind of far, but it's not that far, so let's go check it out. Maybe I can get somebody to hold my camera, and uh, as long as I press the record button, I'll be cool with it, and we'll get me walking across uh, Abbey Road. We've made it. You absolutely cannot write the kind of bad luck that I have. It's going to be hard recreating this uh, album cover with that there, huh? I'm going to hang around a while and see if I can, but literally, wow, right here's where Paul would have been, John would have been in front, here's the crosswalk, they have it roped off, but we'll recreate it the best we can. Here you can see people have signed their names on the brick wall beside it. Abbey Road's kind of one of those historic albums that's um, historic because it was kind of almost like everybody knew the band was over. That was the last album that all the guys were working together on in the studio at the same time. I can't believe this is here. Jeez, that's all right. I will recreate this walk one way or another. So, something like this. And then right there is Abbey Road studios where they recorded all those gigantic <laughs> albums and then there's the walkway that's how close they are if you've never seen it well we did the best we could with the circumstances considering there's a cop car and police tape and everything else we got the best footage we could So if you ever wondered what was on the other side of that intersection, it's this. A lot of police hubbub today. Well, I've been hanging out here for about a half an hour to see if they're gonna shut things down or move this, and I think they're finally going to. They've taken away the tape, so we'll see if they get rid of the car. If they get rid of the car, then we'll do the accurate shot. Well, it actually doesn't look like they're gonna move the car, so I'm gonna go over here now that they've moved some of the police tape and show you a little bit closer shot of Abbey Road. I know people wanna see that. Abbey Road Studios webcam. <laughs> Look at that. A lot of people showing their love. And Black Rose. There we go, they finally moved the police car. Now everybody's coming out of the woodwork for that photo. Well, this would be a nice matchup, huh? What the Beatles would look like now. Well, I'd say this is as good a place to end this vlog as any, right? Here on Abbey Road. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all who have contributed to this trip. Thank you to everyone who's been, uh, you know, watching these vlogs for over two years. Hope you enjoyed this. Have a great night, Lionhearts, and goodbye.